Welcome to our webinar about reining in on sanction evasion and how to stay compliant both in the EU and the US. This event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce in New York. My name is Yvonne Bendinger Rothschild. I'm the executive director of the EICC and I will be your host for today's event. Sanctions only work when they can, effect, can be effectively enforced. Special global sanction regimes like the um, ones we have right now against Russia are hard to track and even harder to enforce. Um, we believe that most um, companies um, are trying to stay compliant, but it's really hard to keep track of all the uh, um, you know, latest um, movements on the sanctions. And this is the reason we put this program together today. We have um, on our panel Matt Moses, he's a partner at Oric, and Matt focuses on fraud, corruption, money launderings, and sanction issues. And he conducts internal investigations, defense companies, and individual and government investigations. We have um, dialing in um, um, today, Helene Dewing Kapoor. She is the European head of sanctions at HSBC. And she leads the team advising on sanctions related matters across all business lines. We have Amber Vitale, uh, Managing Director of Financial Services at FTI Consulting. She has had roles in OFAC enforcement, in-house compliance, legal practice, and consulting. And her projects often involve financial crimes related regulation and compliance, as well as risk management and internal controls. We also have with us Vincent Afoti. Um, he's a partner at Tautov, and um, Vincent heads the firm's investigations and public enforcement practice. And as such, um, he assists clients that are subject of regulatory investigation, supervision, and enforcement. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Alina um, Nadea. He's the head of U she's the head of unit uh, sanctions at DG FISMA, the European Commission. And she works on a wide range of sanction issues. Um, it keeps us all on track, makes sure that we have the sanctions um, that we need, um, shaping um, and negotiating those, and um, offer guidance and their, on their practical implications. Um, our moderator is Matt today, and I will hand over to him with that. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much, Yvonne. i um, really looking forward to this, this panel and hearing what all these distinguished experts have to say. And uh, just wanted to flag that I think you can uh, ask some questions in the uh, chat and we'll be happy to answer them if we uh, can find the time. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, economic sanctions have long been an important foreign policy tool and obviously integral, integral to the private sector compliance programs. But you know, uh, as a sanctions lawyer, I know that sanctions are particularly at the top of mind uh, for companies and financial institutions since Russia invaded Ukraine in February. And the, the EU, the US, and Western allies have imposed unprecedented economic sanctions and export controls against Russia. Um, the goals of the sanctions you know, are uh, President, U.S. President Biden has framed them to inflict pain on Russia, and I think a related goal is to weaken Russia's ability to finance its war in Ukraine. And uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time going over all the sanctions. As Yvonne mentioned, they're complicated, but just at a very high level, there are sanctions against Russian government agencies, state-owned banks, private banks, state-owned companies, and, and many individuals, both government officials and uh, folks without official titles. And you know, in many ways, the sanctions do appear to be working. Uh, Russian citizens and businesses have lost access to Visa, MasterCard, and other payment services. And most forecasters expect Russia, Russia's GDP to contract by at least 10% this year. But uh, if you've been reading the news, you know there have been some reports that these initial waves of financial sanctions have not crippled the Russian economy. And it's unclear whether the sanctions are weakening Russia's ability to fund the war. Russia's still earning, I think it's, I read, roughly $1 billion per day in export revenues from oil and gas. And some experts have uh, opined that the effectiveness of some of the sanctions have weakened over time as uh, Russians have um, found ways to attempt at least to circumvent or evade the sanctions. And you know, as Yvonne led with, detecting sanctions evasion is, is really hard. Um, there was a, a nice anecdote in the Wall Street Journal just uh, two days ago about a town in Switzerland uh, called Zug 
that uh, has the nickname Little Moscow. And because so many Russian billionaires sort of obviously openly and notoriously have homes and businesses there, but reportedly local officials had a really hard time identifying um, whether any of those homes or businesses were owned by the hundreds of sanctioned individuals, uh, you know, based on the Swiss government's list. And in the end, I think they only found one business that was out of roughly 30,000 registered in Zug that they believe was owned or controlled by a sanctioned individual. So uh, hopefully today we can kind of talk about some of those difficulties um, and some of the approaches that uh, companies and financial institutions can take to, um, you know, prevent the evasion and circumvention of these very important sanctions. So with that, Amber, I was wondering if you would kind of set the stage for us and uh, help uh, the, the, the audience know how people are evading sanctions and what financial institutions and companies can do to kind of crack down on sanctions evasion. Sure, hello everyone. And thank you, Matt and Yvonne for opening the session. Um, as I think everyone can probably imagine, OFAC and other regulators in the US and around the world have certainly always been concerned about sanctions for a long time. But now more than ever, evasion is at the forefront of regulators' concerns because there are so many different factors at play and so many tensions that are talked about and really out in the open, which is more unusual than what we've seen in the past. So sanctions are increasingly used as a foreign policy tool so we have more sanctions than ever. And in this particular program, they are very comprehensive. It's not a comprehensive sanctions program per se, but there are many hard hitting sanctions and prohibitions and restrictions. Um, the cross border transactions in our current world are happening at breakneck speed and volume. Uh, we have burgeoning currencies, new virtual currencies and ever increasing internet based activity. And along with that comes some regulatory gaps or difficulty in using traditional compliance methods to identify potential evasion where transactions might be more anonymous or more difficult to track. And so let's face it, with all these things happening, we know that evasion is happening more than ever. And it's harder than I ever to identify because in addition to the things I already mentioned, the evaders are getting more and more sophisticated. The targeted governments are sponsoring evasion tactics, even by entities and individuals in the private sector. It's not just the government actors anymore, not just the state-owned entities and government officials. And then we have various jurisdictions partnering like never before to issue multilateral sanctions, which are plugging up channels that targets could previously turn to uh, in order to affect the transactions that they wanted to on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is making would-be evaders like the Russian government, Russian oligarchs, and um, you know, targeted Russian businesses desperate to evade the sanctions. Uh, and they have more to lose and also more to gain through evasion. So they're extremely motivated. But then on the other side, in my view, the US agencies at least have realized the gains they can make in achieving their missions by partnering to share information, including intelligence and substantive expertise and complementing each other's strengths in working that way. So this allows them to increase the volume and the magnitude of their enforcement actions, achieve their political goals and their humanitarian goals, et cetera. So they're going for and are more able to catch bigger fish, get bigger penalties and more criminal convictions. So the regulators and prosecutors are also extremely motivated. So this is becoming a true battle of wills in my opinion. Um, and we're seeing more than ever uh, evasion tactics where people are using financial practices, evasive financial practices that is, and front companies, particularly international companies. Um, these methods might not be likely to surprise anyone, but uh, the newer things on the evasion front are uh, using financial practices that make it easier to evade sanctions, such as vir virtual currency, uh, and using sanctions evasion networks, which could include dozens of entities, maybe even hundreds, 
and individuals as well as entities in various countries and sectors, thereby forming networks, which make it extremely difficult. I mean, it's difficult as it is to identify front companies, but when you have networks like this, and sometimes people, entities, and individuals in the network are not only in different countries, but they might even be in industries that are totally unrelated to the sanctions target, which makes it very difficult to spot. So for a variety of reasons, it could be that, for instance, in a recent uh, enforcement action, some of the entities were involved in health services and um, things, agricultural products, things that you wouldn't normally put on your high risk for sanctions violations you know, requiring EDD or you know, monitoring of accounts. So these things become harder to identify because they seem benign on the surface. So yeah, I, I think that's right, Amber. So what are, uh, what do you suggest that companies and institutions do to detect sanctions evasion? I think financial institutions and companies have to continue to use the critical compliance tools that have been touted for years, including KYC, and as part of that, the due diligence, CBD, and where appropriate EDD. And I'm not even talking about EDD like under the BSA AML Act in the US, but just going above and beyond to understand who your customers' beneficial owners are, who their affiliates are, to understand something about their business and their anticipated and historic activity so that you can more easily identify atypical transactions, which could be with counterparties in unusual industries or locations or money coming into accounts or requests to make payments via proprietary banking systems or settlement hubs, anything that seems unusual or transactions that don't make sense. And of course, doing sanction screening. And some other forward-leaning things to consider include sharing information with peers and law enforcement wherever possible. I can't stress enough, when I was in-house at a financial institution, the benefit that we gained from going to roundtables with people at other banking institutions, having an open dialogue with regulators, and particularly getting a seat at the table to talk to OFAC about issues because we went collectively, uh, which had much more power than just going alone. Um, and then, of course, staying abreast of the latest sanctions evasion schemes that are seen in the industry or shared by law enforcement, teasing those out into your transaction monitoring scenarios um, and creating red flags checklists. Um, and if you have the budget, there are some due diligence services that are really amazing in the industry now. They can connect targets, that sanctions targets with other individuals and entities that are many layers removed. And there's also taking the data that you have regarding your customer's activity, for example, and using AI or data analytics to flush out potential sanctions evasion or things that are unusual and would require a closer look. Um, so this information might allow you to more easily identify accounts and transactions that require a closer look. Yeah, I've seen that the New York DFS put out, you know, particularly in the crypto space, put out some guidance about um, using transaction monitoring and analytics and uh, blockchain analytics to kind of trace the uh, the sanctions evasion or you know trace the the transactions like deeper into the chain rather than just who you're talking to as a counterpart, but like further on into the chain. So this is interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that makes a lot of sense. But as we were talking about before, Amber, you know, it's like easier said than done, I think. So, you know, Helen, I was wondering, uh, you know, in practice, like, how are you dealing with these types of evasion techniques? And what are the difficulties that you're account, uh, encountering and kind of implementing? that? Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's so interesting listening to discussions around evasion because I think where banks are, or certainly where we are at the moment, is 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 even a, a step ahead of that. Like before, 
before the evasion um, line. I mean, from my perspective, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around evasion versus circumvention versus sort of accidental acts that are being done um, by clients because the, the huge difficulty we have with these um, sanctions, which are completely unprecedented and extremely complex, is the immense differentiation between the different sanctions regimes. So although obviously from the start, the discussion from the authorities was to try and take a multilateral approach, it, it really hasn't happened. Um, I've seen so many articles that have tried to articulate just how different these sanctions are, but you know, there are, there are multiple examples where a tiny tweak, so I know for example in, in Switzerland, they have stayed very close to the European sanctions, but in one particular Article 5, which a lot of us on this call I'm sure are incredibly familiar with, the, the, the Swiss version of the um, regulation just included one small, two small words, a bank and banks, which, which basically completely changed the meaning at the application um, of that restriction. So you're in a situation where everybody's trying to, to, to adhere to these sanctions and I think in the introduction it was it was noted that we think that most of most people are trying to adhere to them and I, I think that's really true with these um, but I think a lot of our clients are facing a, a, a tricky balancing act between litigation risk where they have contractual responsibilities um, and perhaps because of the fact that you you uh, that there are different applications of these sanctions in different territories you might not always be able to um, lean on the illegality clause in your contracts. So often clients are trying to find ways to do something that that might be prohibited in one jurisdiction but not in another. So you know, currency toggles, changing the currency um, that you're that you're making a, a payment in, or using a different account in a different country, those types of things. And, and you know, so is that evasion? Is it circumvention? It, you know, not not really, but it could be deemed to be. And there are some circumstances where it, where it could be. And obviously, that's it's more um, accidental, or it's it's try not so much accidental. It's active, but it's trying to adhere to other contractual responsibilities. And I, I think that's that's a real difficulty for for a lot of clients. As to how do banks deal with it, I mean, it, you know, it's really, really difficult. And again, as, as I say, it, it's unprecedented. Screening is really interesting because often when you talk to your clients about their screening controls, they will say, well, our controls are your screening controls, dear bank. Um, and, you know, th there are significant limitations to screening. Screening will only pick out what you're actually ser searching for, which is why having strong um, retrospective transaction monitoring controls are also important in addition to, to your screening and keeping on top of what is being screened. I think most banks and and others, um, re, you know, rely on third parties to to implement lists. But those lists can take time to be updated. Um, and in the meantime, you know, you you need to make sure that you are pulling out transactions that are that become prohibited, however quickly um, names are being added to lists. So screening is is not always as effective as it could be. Um, I think you know, there's, a, there's a marked difference between name screening, so knowing which clients you're holding, and transaction screening, because at least with transactions, they are held until you, you have a chance to review them if they're stopped. With name screening, so um, where you're screening your clients, you know, you, often those, those accounts are not blocked until the team has had a chance to review them, and, and obviously with unprecedented volumes, I think most banks are, are really struggling with that. But screening aside, I mean, I, I completely um, agree with the previous speaker around KYC, EDD, absolutely crucial. And, you know, as always, I think it has to be the, the, the key control for, for all clients, for all entities, for all banks, for everyone. But the difficulty with that is obviously we are, we are asking questions that we've never asked before. And there are hundreds of millions of clients to ask those questions of. So, you know, trying to pick out those to prioritize you can you can look at sector risk you can look at um, transactional risk so the flows of um, cash flows that have, that, have, that have occurred but even then you're not going to pick up indirect exposure and, and often the indirect exposure becomes direct because you know money is fungible and different accounts are used and, and, and 
the minute that funds come from a, a country that is that is not Russia or, or Belarus, you you immediately sort of lose that trail, and you're unlikely to know sort of where the funds came from. And that's the same with manufacturing. So it is really, really difficult. And I, you know, the times I've heard people use the word difficult in the last couple of months um, is is in the millions. Um, so I think it is about trying to have discussions with your clients and target what you're looking at. But this will take time to perfect. Um, and so I think open dialogue with our clients is is really the main tool that we have to rely on. Yeah. That was really interesting. Thank you, Helen. It's sort of great to see kind of the practical perspective and, and hear the issues that you guys are struggling with and that we're hearing from our clients. And I think, Vincent, you know, we've been talking about it. Like, how are these difficulties or issues um, presenting itself in your practice? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm very happy to participate in this panel. Um, yeah. Well, basically, um, well, I'm, I'm a lawyer and and uh, I'm working for large law firms, uh, and and we don't see parties uh, here to, in my practice, who will intentionally violate sanctions. Um, uh, what we see is basically companies struggling with the sanctions, um, and uh, our clients understand very well that the sanctions in place impose many restrictions for their day-to-day -day business. At the same time, of course, they want to protect their uh, legitimate uh, business interest. Uh, sometimes they actually want to terminate contracts or joint ventures, uh, or um, uh, be, they want to, uh, sometimes they want to uh, sever uh, their ties with Russia at all. Uh, so, um, they seek more they seek guidance and and in practice it's not always to always easy to provide those guidings uh, guidance uh, from the European Union union uh, there uh, I, I must say uh, guidance uh, is provided and is very helpful but uh, I think we will speak on the um, uh, the enforcement uh, later on, but um, the uh, national authorities are responsible for the enforcement. So the interpretation of the uh, European sanctions um, are for a large part the responsibility of the, the national authorities uh, as well, uh, next to the uh, European Commission, and that makes it sometimes very difficult. Um, so. Whereas the clients are looking for guidance, it's not always very easy to uh, to provide a, that guidance. Also, what we see in Europe, and especially in the Netherlands, is that some lawyers are quite hesitant to uh, advise on these sanctions uh, because um, uh, of their own position as well, both legal and from a, a reputation um, uh, point of view. Um, for instance, it's not, it is clear that any, um, any uh, activities also from lawyers um, that uh, would be, um, uh, that would be asked or the, the activities uh, to circumvent the sanctions are prohibited also by lawyers. That's clear. It's clear that, on the other hand, providing legal assistance in proceedings is uh, possible. But there is, a, there is a bit of a gray area in which you advise on compliance, uh, uh, sanctions compliance, and it's not always easy to determine whether or not uh, advice can be given where the, the the line is, and what does not help is that the Dutch Bar Association has said that the provisions, uh, the provision of legal services, um, must be seen, should be seen as making available economic resources, which is uh, prohibited. To be clear, I think this is incorrect from a legal point of view, um, but but it's a fact. It's it's a fact of life for me as a lawyer. 
uh, that this is the point of view of the Dutch Bar Association. Maybe wrong, but still, that's the competent authority uh, on, on, on lawyers. So, so on the other, one hand, we have the clients looking for guidance. On the other hand, we have some uh, lawyers struggling with um, the uh, regulations themselves as well. Yeah, I think, you know, we're experiencing something like that in the U.S. too, kind of just the sort of like the shadow sanctions, just the reputational risk that even if you're providing legal advice or you're doing legitimate business that is not currently prohibited in sanctions, either um, there's some reputational risk uh, or, you know, the sanctions are changing rapidly and what you can do today or what you feel comfortable with today, you know, might not um, be okay tomorrow. And I, I know uh, for, uh, on the U.S. side, OFAC is doing a lot of work to help the industry uh, understand the sanctions and provide guidance. And I also know, you know, from conversations with Alina that uh, the European Commission is also doing the same. And so I was wondering, you know, Alina, what actions is the EU taking to address sanctions evasion um, in this context? Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, depending on where you are. And thank you very much for, for the invitation as well for, for today. Very happy to be here. I think it's it's an excellent moment to ask that question, Matt, and, and I'm happy you're asking it today and not a year ago, because a year ago I would have finished the answer in about 30 seconds and said, well, we're doing quite a lot, but I would not have been able to give many, many examples, because I think the, the, the main activity of, of the Commission back in the day was uh, sanctions design and, and position, and, uh, as Yvonne put it, making sure that we're all stocked up in, in sanctions, but not so much making sure that we also understand what, what we put in place and, and we help each other and help the, uh, the companies to, to actually implement what we have out there. Now, things have changed in part because the focus has changed institutionally, but also uh, we, we have to be, uh, to be honest about it because of the Russia sanctions. And I think uh, colleagues have, have already mentioned uh, before me how important and how unprecedented these sanctions are, not only in terms of what they politically, the message they, that they politically uh, send, but also how much they mean and what kind of a burden they can be for companies and for individual, uh, individuals out there who need to comply with them, who have um, enormous exposure to Russia, who have business uh, relations, uh, subsidiaries, what have you, in, in, in Russia and need to make sense of these sanctions. So that's why we started doing quite a little bit. The most important initiative that, that we've taken was to, uh, to somehow uh, try to mirror, we're not there yet, but we're trying to mirror what, what OFA has been doing for so long, to take their good example and to put out uh, frequently asked questions as frequently uh, as, as we can which basically means uh, since uh, Russia sanctions started about twice per week, you have, we have new frequently asked questions, updates, explanations on what uh, provision X means, what derogation Y should be uh, intended to, to stand for it, and so on and so forth. Um, all this is done in cooperation, very, very close cooperation with, with national competent authorities and also with companies. We have received thousands and thousands of questions from companies. Obviously, we can't answer all of them. So what we are trying to do is to take the most topical ones and transform them into, um, into guidance. Um, on top of that, uh, so there, there's, a, there's a guidance that's out there. There's a lot of individual um, uh, engagement, bilateral engagement actually with, uh, with companies and with associations of, of companies. Particularly we try to, to work with associations and federations because then there is a multiplying effect of, of the message and, and they help us get to us as far as we can to, uh, to those actually interested. Uh, there's quite a lot of engagement with uh, national authorities because in the end, and as, uh, as Vincent was, was saying, in the end, they are the ones who will ultimately say, guys, this is like that, you do it. And if you don't do it, then you might have uh, law enforcement uh, issues. So we're trying also to work with them. We have several uh, working groups which we have started in the aftermath of, of Russia, a little bit earlier as well, but mostly in, in the aftermath of Russia, um, trying to make sure that we all understand the same thing uh, in, um, when we look at our sanctions. And that's important because we obviously, institutionally, again, as Commission, want everybody to, uh, to, to uh, somehow relay our message. 
there's a little bit of an ego uh, issue there. But quite seriously, I'm just joking now, but very seriously, what we don't want to do is to add burdens to, to global companies, to companies uh, operating on in cross-border by taking one view in, let's say, Belgium and yet another one in, uh, in one of the neighboring countries. So that's what we're trying to do uh, currently. Um, we're also uh, quite uh, quite active in uh, in helping member states detecting uh, sanctions evasion, but perhaps we can get to that in uh, uh, a, a little bit further in uh, in our discussions. Um, and uh, I think those would be the would be the main uh, the main initiatives that have been put out there. And then we try as often as we can to, to be in events like this one to to, to be able to uh, to reach out directly and to hear directly from from our stakeholders. Yeah. Thank you, Lena. That's really, I mean, it's such a pleasure and benefit, I think, to the private industry and to us to hear from, from regulators. So, you know, really appreciate that. I think, you know, the way I think of how to, how governments and uh, can kind of crack down on sanctions evasion is that you can provide a lot of guidance. Um, and then like the flip side of that, the stick is the uh, enforcement. And so I was wondering, you know, we can talk both about uh, EU and member states enforcement and then U.S. enforcement. And so I want to kind of start with the, the EU and member state side with, with Vincent and Alina, if you have anything to add on that enforcement front, like what's going on right now? Yeah, well, as I said, the, the, the European sanctions uh, regulations contain the, the substantial, uh, substantive provisions and prohibitions. Uh, they do not contain provisions of enforcement uh, or supervision or uh, prosecution. Uh, that's up to the member states. They have they are re responsible for that. Um, so th there's no central re European uh, supervisor on on this. Um, so the um, the member states are responsible for the enforcement. Uh, have to apply the European uh, sanctions regulations individually. That requires, obviously, to um, uh, interpret uh, or um, and 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 uh, like Alina uh, Alina uh, just talked about the 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 the, uh, the facts and they they are really helpful. They are really helpful because it brings a lot of. Uh, clarification um, and, and that's very important I think for companies but still uh, interpretation remains difficult in practice um, and um, uh, sometimes the guidance uh, on the European level does not always uh, correspond with the definitions in national law so that brings uh, new uh, questions that's very difficult but 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 again I have to stress that the, the the facts really really from the European Commission are really helpful um, for companies and lawyers um, but when we look at the uh, the the national level uh, we see a very diverse landscape I think uh, as I understand it in uh, Germany France Italy and Belgium, there are uh, there is central uh, control and co uh, coordination on the uh, the sanctions uh, enforcement. Um, but in the Netherlands, where I practice, uh, this is very difficult. Uh, different. Uh, the sanction provisions are uh, enforced through both criminal law and uh, civil enforcement. Uh, there's no central body uh, responsible for the in uh, the enforcement. Um, in criminal law, there is a, is one uh, uh, prosecuting authority and one investigating authority, so that's fairly straightforward. But especially the civil enforcement in the Netherlands is very um, um, very difficult. There are three uh, departments involved. Um, Customs is involved. We have two financial regulators for the financial institutions who are responsible for the enforcement of the, uh, the sanctions. Uh, and in addition, uh, some other uh, bodies are in charge of um, granting permissions. So that's, that's very difficult, not only complicated for the enforcement, but it also hinders the ability of parties to obtain guidance on a national level. 
so apart from the, the European level. So that's that's um, that's very difficult. Um, when we look at the, the results, I, I think um, I think it's quite striking if we look at the large differences between member states when it, for instance, comes to frozen assets. The, 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 there are, uh, to some extent, this may be uh, related to, well, the size of the country, uh, the member states, and the structure of the economy, but well, maybe um, Alini can um, can um, uh, add to that. But but um, I, I think it's it, it, there must be more to that. Um, um, for instance, in the Netherlands, we have a lot of holding structures, uh, so you would expect a large amount of assets to be frozen. But um, but that that's that's not the case, and it, it might be because only the holding structure is in the Netherlands, and the other, the assets are abroad. It could also be the case that that some of the assets uh, have has disappeared because our government has had, had way too long with uh, with uh, taking message uh, measures. Um, so so it's 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 quite complex. Um, criminal enforcement in the Netherlands has been very limited up to now, but, but I expect there will be an increase in uh, criminal cases uh, in, the, in the next uh, few months, but or maybe years. Yeah, that, that I mean, yeah, I guess things are just starting and uh, maybe uh, the, yeah, we'll see, we should expect probably more enforcement to be coming down the line. Um, Amber, from the U.S. side, you know, uh, Alina was mentioning uh, they were looking to OFAC as a model for some guidance, and I was wondering your thoughts on, or if you could update the audience on, maybe both like what the U.S. is doing from a guidance perspective and also from an enforcement perspective. And, and I do see an audience question that is like well suited that I'll I will ask right after we talk about the U.S. enforcement. So, sure. So I think that. Um, to the point that Vincent just made it similar in the US, having spent about five years working in an OFAC penalties and enforcement, I know there can be a number of years between when a sanction is issued or sanctions program um, takes effect and when you start to see enforcement cases publicized or when OFAC even starts to see enforcement cases. <coughs> Excuse me. So it might be a while before we see the OFAC enforcement cases, but OFAC has been issuing um, designations, I'm sorry, pardon me, designations that um, highlight uh, networks, evasion networks. So for example, um, we just saw on April 20th, OFAC designated entities and individuals that were involved in attempts to evade U.S. and other sanctions against Russia, and these involved Trans Capital Bank and a global network of more than 40 individuals and entities that were part of um, this network led by Russian oligarch Konstantin Malofeyev. And so being able to identify those networks and designate them allows the, the public to be able to not only treat them accordingly as designated persons, but then to be able to do that due diligence and connect dots to expand out even further to other individuals and entities that might be related to them. So that's definitely doing something as far as not enforcement per se, but giving some teeth to the sanctions and helping the public to have tools to be able to keep that ball rolling. Um, and some of the things that are notable in these designations that uh, sort of harken back to some points I made, is that TKB was offering services to banks in Russia, including China and the Middle East, um, excuse me, offering services to banks in Asia, including China, the, the East Asian countries, and as well as the Middle East, particularly in the UAE. They were trying to offer services uh, related to a proprietary internet-based banking system. Uh, known as TKB business. So that would have allowed the banks to make 
payments on behalf of their clients that would evade sanctions. They also sought to create a settlement hub in Asia without involving US or European banks in the clearing process. So I thought in and of itself, if, if you were a financial institution seeing or hearing about this, that of course would be a red flag because the most international um, trade is frequently done in euros or US dollars. So it would be very curious to not involve those types of institutions and clearing any settlements. So these are things where, again, it's giving the designations themselves are giving the public some red flags to look out for. Uh, and then in addition, they've been issuing guidance, whether advisories or joint statements that have red flags that give the public things that they could work into their transaction monitoring scenarios or add to their checklists of things to look out for when they're opening accounts. Uh, one of them was issued by FinCEN. Uh, another was issued by FinCEN in conjunction with BIS. And those red flags that are in those statements are really something that in some cases is information that the public might not have or red flags, things to look out for that aren't so self-evident. But then other things are things that you would imagine, like if you have third parties that appear to be um, obfuscating who the beneficial owners are or source of funds, things of that nature. So I won't go into detail about the red flags here because I know we want to have a lot to cover, not a lot of time, but I highly recommend looking at those statements issued by FinCEN and FinCEN and BIS and um, a joint statement by FinCEN along with federal banking regulators, including the OCC and the Federal Reserve Board. Um, and then the U.S. has also put together some task forces and programs to help give teeth to the Russian sanctions, notably the Klepto Capture Task Force, which was announced by the U.S. Attorney General in March. And I think that this interagency law enforcement task force is given a very specific mission of fast tracking and bringing about enforcement and sanctions and export restrictions and countermeasures imposed by the US in response to the Russian invasion in the Ukraine. And what I think shows how committed the US is to this endeavor is that the team has cross expertise, dedicated experts from criminal prosecution, intelligence, substantive experts in sanctions and export controls, anti-money laundering, asset forfeiture. It's like the dream team of affecting the task force's mission. And particularly of note is that they are working with not only across agencies in the US, but with in agencies in other countries. And so I think that really shows the commitment to getting the job done, not just any one U.S. mission or any one U.S. agency mission. And then they're also similar um, or supporting kleptocracy asset recovery rewards program, which um, Congress recently established uh, in order to further the U.S. government's commitment to combating foreign corruption. So if assets can be found that are related to oligarchs, for example, or others that have supported the Putin regime and corrupt practices, they will be looking to get those assets. And possibly there's even been talk about using them to, at the end of the day, after judicial processes to maybe help Ukraine rebuild. So these are some of the things that are happening in the US to show the commitment to this, um, the Russian sanctions foreign policy. Yeah, that may, I, if I recall correctly, I think um, when the, the same day the repo task force was announced, um, the US government brought its first enforcement action of violation of the Crimea sanctions, right? So it's kind of like, maybe it takes a while for the enforcement to get up, but I think there was a message in the timing of that, so, that, so that makes sense. So we have some good questions from the audience that were, I wanna uh, make sure we ask. Uh, this one is for Alina, and I think also, Helen, uh, there's, it's related to a, Point that you were going to talk about a little bit later, so maybe you can both kind of address this issue. But uh, the question is, what should a company do 
where NCAs in two different EU member states, where it has a presence, uh, sorry, maybe I'm reading this wrong. What should a company do uh, where NCAs in two different EU member states where it has a presence have provided conflicting interpretations of asset freeze provisions? Does that make sense? Should I start? Yeah, go ahead. Well, it, there's a very short answer, call me. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. So there is, of course, national competence authorities in the end are, are sovereign to, to issue the, the guidance that they want and to have their own interpretation, and we won't be able to coerce them in British Commons into thinking something different. But what we can do, and we do quite frequently, is to discuss uh, any issues where we see that they, uh, they don't see eye to eye, to just discuss uh, those issues with them until we get to a common uh, to a common understanding and most of the times it's not even an ideological position or something that they have always thought would be like that it, it's just new things that pop up that in the heat of the moment one authority or one uh, someone working in, in that authority thinks is a somebody else thinks it's b and we just need to think things through so i do totally encourage you when when you have that to, to reach out to us and, and we'll bring everybody around the table and, and try to sort it I think I'm going to take Alina up on that, calling her. I'm just going to ignore the only joking. <laughs> um, this is this is this is a very very significant issue for us and for our clients. Um, it you know it is a real problem. I've literally had two calls today on different issues where this has happened, um, and it, it's definitely a problem. I, mean, I think from my perspective, the answer has to always be in the answering of the business and to our clients is you have to abide by. Um, what has been said by your local authority um, in, in that jurisdiction. I think that that has to take precedence and, and that's relatively clear. Um, there could be different reasons why they are taking a particular approach. So where something is a little bit unclear um, or it may not have been drafted with the unintended consequences that it has in mind, which is something I think we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, we will seek clarification and often we'll seek clarification in, you know, 10 different jurisdictions and get a very, very different answer. What we will generally do in, in that situation is, is share the answer that we're getting from the different authorities with each of them to try and say, look, this is, this is what we're hearing. This is what we think is right. This is our interpretation. Do, do you still stand by what you said before, given what the other competent authorities are saying? Um, and that has that has really been, I think, helpful. I think it's it's important to work closely with the competent authorities because they are as swamped as everyone else. They are getting a huge amount of queries, um, and I, I think that they are also struggling. So to share what's being said and and to really explain to them why certain things have a consequence that you know may be harming the wrong party um is is really important one of the things that we're also doing is is saying to the authorities do you need access to subject matter experts like for example in the banking field so people who really understand securities do you need to sit down with someone and talk about how custody works because you know often i think that that's why i'm so lucky in the bank is that i have access to all these incredible people who really really understand products that i could never understand um and so to be able to give the authorities that sort of access and to share information between the authorities so that they know what's being said in different locations and to understand their own local approach and why they might be taking a slightly different interpretation of something is is important but my overriding message is you do have to um, abide by what is required in, in that jurisdiction yeah i guess related to that question and we were gonna maybe talk about it a little bit before are um where there are sanctions in one jurisdiction but not in another say for example for like a u.s financial institution that has a company that's uh, owned by an or has a beneficial ownership interest in a in a in this company where that person is sanctioned not in the United States but sanctioned in some other jurisdiction like in the EU. I mean, are how are financial institutions kind of handling those issues? Is there a policy where if you're sanctioned in one place, you're sanctioned everywhere, or are we are you trying to navigate um, the the distinctions between the different regimes? So from our perspective, and I think for most financial institutions, it's very much that we try to take a global policy of a global approach. And that's for 
for simplicity to ensure that you are really adhering to um, because of the fact that money is fungible and it can easily cross border if you try to take a tailored approach to what is actually applicable in each jurisdiction then often it gets in a muddle and, and you end up with funds going to a jurisdiction where it would have been prohibited for certain activity um, the other reason for doing it is because you know most financial institutions are very international so you know I'm sitting here in Canary Wharf in London but the bankers I've spoken to today are from all over the world um, and the problem is that you know you often you find yourself on this, let's say a reputational risk committee which is a key tool that that um, most financial institutions use to make really difficult decisions often that committee will have people who are EU persons or they're US persons and they're in the UK um, and so if you try and really tailor it then often you have to start each call with half the people on the call recusing themselves and being removed from that call um, so it is better to try and take a, a general policy approach uh, that that is that, that and, and in my opinion that should always be the highest level however as I said you do have to in, in when I spoke before, you have to balance that with the litigation risk because um, you know clients and the bank itself are facing um, con contractual constraints where an illegality clause will not apply because um, it's not illegal to do certain activity. So those two things do have to be balanced, and it it can be really, really, really difficult. And that's why you have to really sit down with each transaction, work through the different nuances, think of everything, and and try and get yourself into a, a sort of safe position where you're taking the right approach. I I mean I have a, a kind of a, an example like last night I received um, some papers for a reputational risk committee that is supposed to be occurring tomorrow. Um, and just having a quick read through it on the particular client, I know that the majority of the people on that committee, if they were, if I hadn't noticed that paper, which is, I'm getting over a thousand emails a day, so I could have easily not noticed it. If I hadn't have pulled it from that committee and they had made the decision that they, that seems like a very, um, you know, easy decision to make. It's potentially going to be an exit decision, which feels um, innocuous. But if they had made that decision, it would have resulted in a flow of funds to a designated party in a different jurisdiction and would therefore potentially have been a criminal offence in the UK for all the people who are UK persons that would be on that call, which is at least 20 people. So it is, it is really, really difficult. And, and that's why everything is taking time. I know that um, clients are getting frustrated with their with their banks uh, stopping and blocking and reviewing transactions for and, and taking a long time over it. But that is really why everybody needs to be incredibly careful. Well, uh, yeah, that was really helpful insight. <laughs> so it sounds complicated and a thousand emails a day. Uh, so I, we have another question, uh, I think for Alina. Um, Obviously, the application of evasion laws will ultimately depend on the national authorities. But on a general level, what is the EU expecting from this? Do they have the experience of OFAC in mind as a kind of role model for this type of topic? That's a, that's a tricky one. So perhaps on this one, it will depend whether uh, the, um, the recording can be left on the website or not. So let me see what I say and, and what words. No, um, I'm kidding again slightly. Uh, no, I don't think that as of today, we would be able to say that we have the OFAC experience in mind or the OFAC model in mind for ourselves as some sort of a supranational enforcement agency. We're not there for, for lots of different reasons, whether legal or, or institutional or, or whatever. I'll, I'll spare you the bureaucratic uh, blah, blah. What we are trying to do is, is to make sure that where enforcement does take place, which is at national level, that it is uniform. That you don't have somebody going to jail in a member state and just walking out uh, as if nothing had happened in another one. Um, uh, that's, um, that again, companies know what to expect in every single jurisdiction. The latest push that we are um, we are giving on on our side is towards, uh, and that's not against companies uh, which do their job. It's it's rather against companies who don't. Um, it's to to push member states to have more uniform penalties when it comes to sanctions breaches. When they when they enforce so that at least you know what you, you can expect in, in different member states, and you can expect similar things. Uh, lately, we've been pushing for um, uh, provisions such as uh, criminal penalties for sanctions breaches, willing sanctions breaches, 
We're also looking into the possibility to confiscate assets when, when sanctions are, are breached and so on and so forth. And to help all of you who have difficulties in, um, in, in implementing, for instance, asset freezes, one of the examples that we think we will want to take going forward is that of the German um, authorities, which have introduced for the listed person an obligation to self-report assets that they have within their within that jurisdiction. So for the EU, it would be any listed person would need to report to the national competent authority uh, where, where they are located, what assets they have in that jurisdiction. What does that mean that for, for banks and for companies and so on and so forth, it will become easier to know what's where. Um, and, uh, and also for all of us, and, and Vincent was mentioning earlier, for all of us, it will become easier to enforce the asset freeze without actually having to, to go after, uh, after the good guys and, and telling them, ah, you've missed this one euro uh, hidden somewhere. But we're not OFAC like yet when it comes to enforcement. But, but maybe to, to add to that uh, very briefly, uh, be, because the question is, is politically sensitive, so it's, it's difficult for Alina to, 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 to answer um, in a way. But, but um, I think if we look at the, the, the topics we just discussed, the, 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 the guidance, the, the differences in enforcement, I, I think uh, to, uh, I think to, it, it, it could help to strengthen the role of the uh, European uh, uh, Commission at least um, in coordination. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, like Alina and Helen said, um, uh, coordination in case of different uh, uh, opinions about the, the, the substance of the uh, provisions. Yeah, um, as, a, as a US lawyer, I, and I guess Amber can speak as a former OFAC uh, enforcement lawyer, you know, a regular, um, it's, it's interesting to hear about, but I think, uh, one, one sort of thing that jumped to mind is that um, this is a really coordinated sanctions regime. It feels like more coordinated than it has been even between OFAC and um, uh, the European Commission and member states. And uh, I, uh, it's certainly a change from the previous US administration when sanctions were rolled out and everyone was like, what's going on? Um, but, and so I guess what I'm, that's the preface to um, OFAC has like very broad extra, believes it has very broad extraterritorial jurisdiction. And there's sort of a history of OFAC um, enforcing that jurisdiction uh, abroad. And uh, sometimes we get comments or discussions with clients based in Europe, like how can you, how can this happen? How can you do this? We're, we're not touching the US. Um, but I, I think in this case, uh, there is increasing coordination, although I will say, that um, the Treasury Department has been kind of like on a tour, and particularly in the Middle East and Africa, warning financial institutions about the potential of secondary sanctions and OFAC's broad extraterritorial jurisdiction to enforce US laws abroad to the extent that they you know, are in US dollars or touch the US financial market in any way. It's sort of interesting um, point. We're, we're almost out of time, um, I, but I did want to like just give folks an opportunity to kind of give last minute thoughts. You know, uh, what do we do now? There are all these complications. There's a lot of guidance. Everyone's working really hard to, to help tamp down on um, sanctions evasion, both um, from the regulator side, from the bank side, from the, from the lawyers and, and consultant side. So, you know, do, do we have thoughts about what's next, Lena? And I think what's next, well, what should be next is, and, and you very well pointed it, uh, even further coordination with international partners. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that we, we can still do better. Uh, we're very coordinated, we're, we're quite aligned, but we could be better aligned, particularly for companies which are active globally. Uh, better coordination also internally, I think that never harms. And, and one of the projects that I do hope to see in my lifetime is I'm some sort of a of a public-private partnership on sanctions implementation. This is something I would really, really want to put together. Because I think it was Helene saying earlier that she's lucky to, to have in, uh, uh, in, in the bank access to people who know things that she, she, she pretends she would never understand. And this is a little bit the same that we sometimes feel as, as regulators that 
there are things out there that we would understand so much better if we could work much more closely on, on these uh, topics with, with the private sector. I'll leave it at that. It's just, you know, my list uh, of, uh, of wishes to Santa Claus. That, yeah, that, that sounds great. Uh, I think uh, the public sector would greatly appreciate that opportunity. Um, anyone else? Helen, Vincent, Amber? For me, I think we, we talked about EDD. I think that that big exercise is, is really going to start now. So I think clients need to, need to be open and bear with banks and other financial institutions that are asking you questions because it's really going to be the only way that we are able to, to whittle down what the real risk is. So I think that's going to be a, a big topic for the next probably couple of years. Yeah, law, law firm clients too. We've added a lot of questions to our onboarding things that I think people are surprised to, to be hearing. So yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Ivana. Very good. Thank, thank you, everyone. And um, Alina, we're happy, um, you know, to facilitate a dialogue like that if you if you would like us to. Um, we're doing that with a, um, a number of DGs, so um, you know we can talk about um, you know that conversation later. Um, but this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for our panelists for sharing their um, expertise, and I hope that our audience members now better understand what they need to know about sanctions. And if not, um, you can always reach out to us, and we can connect you to our panel for um, if you have additional questions. This is a super complex issue and, and, um, and constantly changing. So um, it was important to, um, to have that conversation and I really appreciate um, all of you joining us. Um, a quick reminder, if you're a member of the EACC and you would like to connect with any of the other participants, um, you know, we do this um, for the webinars as long as we're not meeting in person. We're happy to facilitate an introduction, so um, you will get a list of attendees and just reach out to us. Um, we have a couple more programs com um, coming up before, um, before the summer. Um, forced labor statute, also ever-evolving topic, um, on July 27th. And um, our uh, um, next in-person event is um, at, on October 5th, looking at risk as a mosaic. We have a pro another webinar on uh, um, the 14th of September on uh, um, business interruption insurance. And um, we will have the, uh, a recording of this program up on our website um, after we get all the approvals. And um, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.